If you listen to VC Twitter, if you follow the venture capital topic on LinkedIn, you may have noticed how professional investors like to complain about universities taking too much equity in the startups uh, born out of their research for the intellectual property that the startup needs to license from the university. These complaints are often warranted. Indeed, there is a moral hazard as the intellectual property to build the startup from is captive to the university. It doesn't have to be like that. Welcome to Professors on the Cap table, where I discuss the problem of how much of an equity stake the university should take in startups born out of the research for the services or the support it provides. My name is uh, Dirk Wielem. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Erlangen in Germany. I have co-founded many startups and I invest in my PhD student startups. To get started, we need to understand that universities and professors speak a very different language than professional investors. The stakeholders of professors are the public funders who fund their research, which would like to talk about technology, for example, in terms of technology readiness levels, TRLs, one, six, seven, eight, and so forth. I have yet to meet a professional investor who looks at a startup using TRLs, five, six, seven. Rather, a professional investor will take a comprehensive picture. They want to understand the team, uh, the social dynamics of the founders and the team, the uh, vision they have, the product, the product idea, the markets it serves, the market size, the intellectual property, any moats there might be to protecting that business. In addition to basing an investment decision on a comprehensive picture analysis, investors also have a particular pattern of how the ideal startup looks like as it progresses to through stages. That's the idea. Uh, the ideal startup goes through stages, one after another, succeeding, completing each stage, each stage without fail. And advancing to the next stage. A stage has a particular goal. Here current industry terminology is the stages are idea, pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C. And the purposes of idea, the purpose of idea is to form the team in an idea, maybe have a demo, raise seed funding, which is then used to remove the technical risk, demonstrate that the product can be built and maybe one or two customers are, are buying because their problem is so severe to them. On to a seed stage funding, which finances the uh, further development of the product, uh, first salespeople being employed to show that non-founders can sell the product, ultimately to demonstrate product market fit. On to series A, growing revenues in the established market, market segments. The ideal startup, raises funding at the beginning of a stage, raises enough funding to make it through the stage, and then shortly before it runs out of money, it uh, finishes the stage and acquires funding for the next stage to minimize equity dilution of the founders. The typical startup here then starts at the beginning of pre-seed. The idea stage, you don't need money for that. It's uh, friends or a team. Um, investigating ideas, maybe building a prototype, and if they decide to incorporate as a startup, they are then off to raising pre-seed funding to show that the product they envision can be built and that it's enough of a problem they are solving so that someone is buying. The thing that should not happen to a startup is to get stuck in the middle of a stage, run out of money in the middle of a stage. So if a startup raises money for making it all the way through pre-seed, but then doesn't finish in time, but rather runs out of money in the middle of the pre-seed, it means that they did not fulfill their promise. So they were not as good as maybe the investors thought and they failed at predicting correctly what would happen. And so they need to raise a bridge or mezzanine or whatever you might call it 
additional funding to help them finish pre-seed, which means that, which typically doesn't come at favorable terms, and also means the founders get diluted further, which makes it a less attractive investment for follow-on investors. Investors, typically before they invest, prefer founders to have rather more equity than less equity in the startup, assuming if it's more, they remain more motivated. Yet, it is exactly in the middle of pre-seed where most startups born out of university research start their life. Clearly, a startup born out of university research is not at the beginning of pre-seed. There have been years typically of public funding into developing some technology, so it's clearly way beyond uh, idea stage. However, it's also not at the beginning of seed because it wasn't a company. Uh, the risk being investigated was research challenges, research questions, but not the tech, which is very different from the technical risk of building a product. So there needs to be more technology development to show that the product can actually be built. And there are certainly no customers if you just incorporate it from the university without working with industry. So the signals aren't there that the startup has reached seed, leaving it in the middle of pre-seed, a space, a place you don't want to be, which is where the moral hazard plays out. If you incorporate in the middle of pre-seed, you need to license the IP. Well, you always need to license the IP from the university, but as you do, you have no other options. It's captive IP. When the PhD students and the professors started their, um, their research work, they had no clear perspective of this. They had no other options from the beginning. They were captive to the university, their employer, which is fine, but needs to be dealt with. Then the university can basically dictate the terms of the equity and is likely, well, that's just very human, uh, to overestimate the actual value of what it is that they are providing. So they'll ask for too much and the potential investors will look at it and see exactly that, think it should be much less, sending off the startup in the middle of pre-seed to a bad start. You know, there's friction right from the beginning between if there are any professional investors or people looking, professional investors looking at the startup and the non-active, non-operational equity holder, the university. There are two other options. One is that the university decides it really wants to send off its startup in the best possible way. And if there's any return, it will be much later in different ways. Then the university can let go of its expectations of significant stake and just take a smaller minimal stake, basically allowing the startup to fall back to the beginning of pre-seed and um, become a much more attractive uh, investment to professional investors. Or, and that's what I would argue the case, the university which actually wants to maintain a significant stake in the startup supports the startup all the way to the end of pre-seed and thereby justifying any stake, a non-trivial stake it takes in the uh, company. Supporting the startup all the way through pre-seed means channeling further funding uh, to the startup, uh, which typically means that it's the professor uh, doing that because the university is really just the platform. So there needs to be an active professor supporting a team, working with the team, working towards a situation where it's recognizable that the team then incorporating at the end of pre-seed actually fulfilled the exit criteria of the pre-seed stage. The technical risk has been removed and they are paying customers, one, two paying customers. That's well possible at a university. A German university can have industry uh, customers they sell to and thereby acquiring the signals needed for a seed investor uh, to check whether pre-seed has been completed. And that's where I argue if the university wants significant uh, equity in a startup where the well-managed startup out of the university should start its life at the beginning as a corporation, at the beginning of seed, where 
seed investors sign off on that the Star University did its job because they invest uh, the requested seed money. So this model of going all the way to seed resolves many issues. First of all, it matches the pattern recognition. Um, the signals are, if done well, the signals are in place. Um, it's clearly the point of time where seed funding is needed and the investors recognize the signals and effectively sign off on the university or whoever was supported, the professors who supported the startup, uh, guided it, supported it all the way through pre-seed. So clear responsibilities, clear handover, clear criteria. At the same time, it resolves the moral hazard problem. Again, <clears throat> the university holds the IP captive and it's not clear at the beginning when the PhD students start their work, how this will play out, uh, leading potentially the university to overestimate their stake and uh, forcing unfavorable conditions on the uh, startup. Now then, for this to be resolved, we now have a situation at the beginning of SEED where the university did clearly a defined job, which can now be related to industry data. And we have good data on what's the typical amount of equity that a pre-seed investor takes from, uh, that it takes from a startup as it finances the pre-seed uh, stage of that startup. It works if the deal that the university offers is the best possible deal that the startup could have got in the marketplace. This removes the moral hazard. If there's no question that the public market would not have done better by the startup, the moral hazard is resolved. How is that? Well, it's actually very obvious that the university does that in this model because it offers a different deal from what a pre-seed investor does. A pre-seed investor gives money and if the startup runs out of money in the middle of pre-seed, it's out of luck. The university offers not money, but the promise to fund the startup all the way through pre-seed, whatever it takes. This is a much better deal than anything that a pre-seed investor could, uh, could offer and hence the uh, university owns uh, offers a deal that removes the moral hazard and then supports or makes it adequate to take the appropriate amount of equity that would be considered common for that stage. The, uh, this was an outtake. This is an outtake of my research to start. What I explained is an outtake of my research to startup program that I teach to German universities with much more information like actual industry data, equity percentages and so forth. And this program is taught to PhD students, typically in the um, STEM mint uh, um, disciplines uh, for high tech startups. So it's three workshops each year, so four years in total, very lightweight, non-intrusive, three half day workshops in a given year, providing to PhD students exactly the needed information at that point of time of their career as PhD students that they need to build out the idea, maintain the idea and maintain the option of turning their research into a startup. We start with the understanding business model and intellectual property, uh, go through team, organization, needed skills and competencies onto public funding and um, pre-seed, making it through pre-seed all the way to uh, venture capital funding. It's a comprehensive program of 12 workshops well integrated, coherent, uh, so little overlap, but nicely integrated, uh, provided by exactly one teacher, me, rather than say 12 teachers that you need to hire. Usually graduate education offices or technology transfer offices employ me for this service and they will get a professor who knows the German Hochschulgesetz inside out, the laws and rules of IP at German universities, a tricky topic that is basically outside professors, nobody really understands and even that is sometimes questionable. Anyway, I do after many years of dealing with it. So that's it from me. If you are interested, if you have questions, shoot me an email or provide a comment below. And with that, it's Godspeed to you and may the entrepreneurial spirits be with you. 
Hope to see you soon.